Welcome to the kanji workshop. So this one in particular is about kanji and especially their radicals and we're going to get into what a radical is and what they are and why they're so important for Japanese and they're sort of the key to how Japanese and Chinese people memorize thousands upon thousands of characters with minimal effort. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about that today and I wanted to also say thank you to JET AA, the uh, Japan Exchange and Teaching Alumni Association of the Rocky Mountains for sponsoring this. They're providing all of the food and tea in the background. And so, um, as I said before, please feel free to ask questions. Anything that you have to say is usually more interesting than my script. So we're gonna jump into this and uh, talk about kanji and how they're designed and how to think about them. So um, the first thing I was saying before was that Radicals, they are these fundamental building blocks of kanji. If you know them, they make kanji a lot easier to work with. And so we're going to get into what a radical is and how it works, how it functions, and what it does. So um, this, th this is the, these are the radicals, this chart here. So we're going to talk about this chart. Looks a little overwhelming at first. This is from the, uh, from the New Nelson Japanese English Character Dictionary. And we're going to get into why this looks the way it does. And I actually have a copy of this for all of you to check out. And so as we're jumping into this, one thing I'd actually like to make really clear um, about sort of how all of this stuff uh, works is that when you look at how ca characters are put together, it's not dissimilar from how English spelling works. So if I were to... Um, Write that on the board. How do you pronounce this? Colonel. Colonel. How do you know that? You just know it, right? Like it's something that you've come into contact with. Here's a simpler example. How do you pronounce this word? Uh, I and not eye, which would make a lot more sense if you didn't speak English. So just keep in mind that we have all of these quirks in our language too. We just don't happen to have ideograms as part of our language. But English spelling is a notorious aspect of our language for people learning it. So although you struggle with kanji, I can assure you that Japanese people struggle with our spelling system. So the feeling of why do they do it this way is mutual. So um, jumping into it. So one of the first things is we have to rethink how you think of kanji. So especially for those of you in the first year of Japanese, you probably think of kanji in terms of strokes. <clears throat> So one, two, three, four, five, six strokes to write this character, which is uh, teta, which means like a, a Buddhist temple. But if you think about it in radicals, that really changes sort of the perspective, because there's not six pieces of it. There's actually, um, does anyone want to take a guess, how many radicals does this uh, character have? Two. You're correct, right? So you have uh, tsuchi, or do, on the top, and sun on the bottom. Um, and we'll talk more about this relationship. And also, when I say that it's made up of radicals, that's a little incorrect. It's a little more sophisticated than that. But we'll talk about sort of the true nature of this structure. So the thing with strokes is that it really kind of creates a lot of labor for you when you're learning to memorize kanji. And you can kind of see this stroke by stroke method in this lithograph. So this is from a book that we own. It's about 300, 400 years old, published in 1670. It's actually up in the CU Boulder Library's special collections. And it's a book of a Dutch expedition to Japan. And so if you look at the kanji here, you can see how truly awful looking it is. So I think like if you look at, um, so if we look at, this is clearly just scribble. Like they made this up because they couldn't reproduce what they were looking at. Um, I would say, you know, this one right here is probably this character. And it could have actually even been um, two separate ones, or it could have even been, um, could have been one of those two options. This is supposed to be Hikari. So they were looking at and going one, two, three, four, five, six, and trying to write it that way. Um, so this is what happens when you try to write stroke by stroke. If you think of kanji as just being structured in strokes, you kind of get a, a sort of awkward looking writing style. And that's not quite how to think about it. There's a better base set of units to work with. 
And so think about it more as uh, that this kanji is made up of different radicals. So if we look at this one up here, how many radicals do you think it's made of? All right, yeah, give me a, give me a hands up for this one. Okay. All right, so for those of you that said four, you have it. And so you may not know these offhand, but this is um, word, grass, or plant, uh, old bird, and later, or mata. So mata, furutori, kusakanmuri, and uh, kotoba, or gen, <coughs> or in this case, gonben. And so this kanji is made up of radicals. So what about three? How many radicals are in three? All right. It's actually the kanji one and the kanji two. Each of these is their own independent radical, believe it or not. So, so, <laughs> so what it is is this is ichi and this is ni, and you put them together and that's how you get it. So it's not one three times, it's actually one and two together. Um, and so when I say that kanji is made up of different radicals, I'm sort of, that, that statement's a little inaccurate. And what I mean by that is technically, every kanji has only one radical. Um, and in this case, for this character, it's this part, uh, gonben it's called, and it means to talk. It's actually, this character is used in the word for lawyer, bengoshi. And so the idea is that, and it means to defend, especially to defend with your words. Um, and that's why, and, and what it is, is this is the core semantic piece of the character. So the radical is sort of like an identifier. It's the means of looking up a character in a dictionary, which, which is what we're gonna deal with next week. And all these other parts, these parts don't actually have a lot to do with the meaning because they're not technically the radical, but they can be the radicals of other characters. So this one means grass or plants. In a lot of uh, kanji related to fauna, or flora rather, you'll see this, con you'll see this radical in it. Um, furutori doesn't quite have a theme that I can think of, and one and two don't quite have themes either that go together. But, uh, but certainly for a lot of words that deal with speaking, you'll see this over and over again. So if you can remember the kanji for hanashi, this is on the left of it also. And it literally means to talk. So it's a logical radical. But all of those can be radicals too, just for different characters. So we have to talk about a few different qualities that radicals can have. So one of the first things that radicals can have is position. right? They have to go into a position. Um, so you may, I'm sure you've noticed this, but you've noticed that kanji, when you look at them, they tend to have a very clear segmented, they have a clear segmentation. So like left and right side, left and right side. And the radical can potentially appear in any of these configurations. So in this case, what is this kanji? Fire, yeah. So it is not just a, this particular radical is also a character on its own. So there's a, hand, there's a bunch of radicals that are also independent characters. In this case, it means candle. In this case, it, it, the kanji means uh, autumn. So you can see these different positions that they can take up. So you can see you can fit them into the corners. In this case, I couldn't find an example of this particular um, radical squeezing into a spot. But just know that it can appear in any of those sort of configurations. And we'll see more of that in the next couple of slides. So one is position. Where, how does it get positioned? Does it get positioned to the left, right, top, bottom, in one of the corners? Or is the entire radical itself a character? OK. So here's kome, or what does this one mean? Rice. Rice, yeah. And so along with position comes compression. So characters. All these kanji have to fit inside of an imaginary square. And so you always have to keep compressing the character down to fit inside this imaginary square. So even if you have a really complex character, it has to fit there. So like, for example, um, and you can see here, like before I didn't have examples of, of these positions, but you can see kome fitting into all of these different spots. Um, this one, how many parts is this made of? Or how many strokes, first, well, first question, how many strokes are there? Can anyone give me the stroke count of this one? 17. I have 18. Um, so, and, and I'll admit I might be wrong, because I always, there's always one part I always confuse. So it's about 18 strokes. So if you have to memorize 18 individual pieces, it's pretty tough. How many radicals are there? Two. Yeah, so does anybody happen to know what this top one means? Deer, shika. 
um, and this bottom part is rice, and this character means reindeer. Um, and it's not to say like, oh, reindeer eat, eat rice, therefore this character is for, that's not how this works. That's not how characters are combined together. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So, um, and again, and remember the radical, so if this is, this character means reindeer, uh, this, yeah, and this character up at the top means deer, this character at the bottom means rice. So which one is the actual radical of this character? Of course, right? The deer radical is the radical in reindeer. But this rice can be its own radical as well. Like it's the radical of this kanji. Um, and so we'll get into some of that again more. So again, we have position and we have compression. When you, when you put the radical into one of these positions, it has to compress down. All right. The other thing, and this is really, really important. This is the one that people really struggle with, is that radicals can have variation. And so um, students really get flustered with this because this and this are the same thing. They both mean fire. Um, right, this one, what's this? Water. How, does anyone know how to say it in Japanese? Mizu. And so he, over here you'll see two variations. And do you know the other pronunciation for this? Sui. Sui, yeah. So um, this character, what's the word for three in Japanese? So what do you think they call this? Sansui. That's the name of this particular radical, three water. Um, and, and, and each of these variations actually have their own name. So here is heart. And you can see here that there's two other variations on it. This one's a little more, this and this are pretty extreme. right? You kind of have to know. And all Japanese people just sort of grew up learning this and knowing it. They take it for granted that they know. The same way you all take for granted how to pronounce kernel and I. <clears throat> So just be aware of this variation quality. The funny thing is that sometimes the variants are actually more common than the unvaried versions. So this radical you see all the time in Japanese in lots and lots of characters. You almost never see it in its unvaried form. This is almost exclusively, sorry, this is almost exclusively how you see it presented. It's almost always part of another character. I believe, um, I think there's only one prefecture in Japan that uses this in its name, and that's the only time it's ever used. Um, and then, so we, have, um, so we have all these concepts together at once, position, compression, variation, and the fact that the variants can actually be more common than the unvaried versions, and then implied meaning. So what's this kanji mean? Rain. So the rain character. If you see it in uh, different characters, it, it usually has to do with weather. Um, an exception to that might be something like this. So here's rain on the top. And then, uh, sorry, I'm in an awkward position. So rain in the, the bottom part, what does this character mean? Does anybody happen to know it? Zero. Nothing to do with weather at all. So this is not Everything I'm telling you is not 100% true all the time. And this is something that students hate when they're learning, is you want just a one quick, simple answer. But you have to be a little critical when you go into these things. It's not always going to be simple and straightforward. So right, meat or niku, when you see this in radical form, it tends to refer to parts of the body. So when we talk about lungs, the liver, the brain, you'll see this character appear many times. And then kokoro, or heart, is often used when you're talking about like personality and emotion and things like that. Not always. Again, there's lots of situations where I could probably dig up a character that uses this radical and has nothing to do with emotion. It'll mean something like window or something like that. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about some of this stuff. Oh, what's up? Um, so like, you say that kanji only have one radical. So yes. So like, how do you know which one is the radical? Uh, familiarity and guesswork. And logic. There's, there is a logic to all of this, and that's what the second workshop deals a lot more with, is how to like, confront this stuff. <clears throat> so this is um, a book. I actually think it's a pretty good one. It's called Kana and Kanji. And um, what they do is they kind of start you out slow. So instead of giving you this really complicated grid that you see in the Nelson's Dictionary, they give you this much simpler one. And there's a few things here that are worth considering. So first of all, um, remember before when I said that radicals have a position? So those positions actually have special names. So if the radical is to the left 
in, on the left side of the character, that position is called hen. If it's on the right, it's called tsukuri. The top is kanmuri, which literally means crown. Uh, ashi, which means foot, but not the foot that you've learned. There's a different foot character. Kamae, um, and there's a star next to Kamae because Kamae is kind of like this general enclosure radical. Tare is when the enclosure is specifically in the upper, in the top and the left. So, and then nyo is specifically when it's in the, on the left and the bottom, okay? And so there's a few other things going on here. Remember before when I was talking about variation? Um, so look at these numbers. So these are the standard numbers that every radical gets. Every good character dictionary uses the exact same numbers. So if you looked at different kanji dictionaries, they would have the same numbering system. Um, and you'll see that 86 and 86, they're the same, but they, they're in different positions. And then um, also, even if you look up at uh, 60, the thing about that that's tricky is you look at 60, and then if we look at, um, oh, where's its, uh, where's its mate? Um, I forgot what my anecdote was about this particular one. So for 60, that one is often confused with this one, 144. But notice that they have different numbers, so they're not considered the same thing. They obviously look different, but um, so do these, then they're still considered the same. This one kind of gets uh, confusing for students when they're trying to figure things out, and we're going to talk about that similarity soon. So making it a little more complicated, here's that whole neat set of naming conventions. I actually have a handout for that. Here you are. So again, here's all of these different uh, naming conventions. And you'll see for the hens, you've got Nimben, Nisui, Kuchihen, Tsuchihen, Onnehen, Yumihen, Gyonimben, Kozatohen, Nishinben, Tehen, Katahen. The hen keeps appearing over and over again in the names of these things. So if you're a first year student, you don't have to worry about memorizing the names of these things, but just be aware that it's very solidly in the minds of Chinese and Japanese speakers. They're very aware of this positioning system that exists. Um, and this is one of the secrets to them sort of managing to consume so many characters at such a high speed. Um, and that, and of course, living in a culture where you constantly read this, you know, the familiarity you have with it makes it easier. Um, so some of the things I've chosen to point out, notice that there is this kozato hen and ozato, and they look identical, but what makes them different? So where are they located? Where is each one located? So where, where is Kozato Hen? It's on the uh, leftmost side. Mm -hmm. and, and Ozato? On the rightmost Yeah. So they look the same and actually, remember, so do you think, and these are variants, so when you uncompress them, they actually look totally different from each other. But one only ever appears on the left, and one only ever appears on the right. Um, let me see, what's one of the other ones? Oh, so here's Sanzui again. And you'll see up there, there's its partner, Nisui. Um, another one is, uh, so for Ashi, notice that it says Hito Ashi. Notice that the names there are really, un they, don't, they don't follow a particular pattern. Hito Ashi, Kokoro, Rekka, Renga, Sara, and Kogai. Um, and then what was one other point I wanted to make? Oh yeah, remember before I said Ashi, it's not the foot kanji? So for those of you who are further along, you'll see right away that that's a totally different Ashi that you've never seen before. And that's because in Japanese, when you're speaking, Ashi doesn't distinguish between your foot or your leg, but the kanji do. So the kanji that you learn in like 101 Japanese is foot, but that kanji refers to the leg itself. So. <clears throat> and then again, the same book kind of gives you like a, a clearer uh, list of the kanji, and it'll give you generally like a, a tag word like this is what each one means individually. So here's the corpse radical, the sprout radical, the mountain radical, um, the mother or not radical, the lance shaft, all right? Um, and, and look at, this one's kind of interesting because if you look at it, it looks like it should be two separate ones and it's not, all right? That one always trips people up. <clears throat> and did it, oh yeah, it did jump to the, and like here's the other half of them. So if you kind of want to look at a, a clean, neat summary of all of these radicals, this is a nice little list that's in this uh, little book. <clears throat> all right. So the other thing I want to talk about is that this is kind of important. So sometimes what you get 
is when you look at kanji dictionaries, and you see this online sometimes, you see it in print, but they love to tinker and try and make it easier for you as a Westerner. So if you showed this to a Japanese person, they would have no idea what's happening. This system created by Spana Hara Mitsuki, I don't know why they did it this way, because they made this awesome little book that is really handy. It's a great reference tool. But then they made their own di kanji dictionary that sort of goes very counterintuitively to like how Japanese people actually learn the radical system. So, <clears throat> so be aware that different uh, authors will present different systems and creations for you, and yet they sort of um, put a barrier between you and Japanese native speakers because this isn't how Japanese people understand characters to be constructed. And you can see here, it says these are the radicals without variance, and you'll see 2B, that's, um, or sorry, not 2B, uh, where, ah, 3A. It says that the variant is not the variant, but it is the variant. So I don't even know why they have it flipped the way they do. So you're learning essentially the wrong perception of all of these things. Okay. Now, this beast of a chart is the, 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 most, commonly one, the most common one used. So this is the Nelson Radical Index. So when we talk about how you were saying before, how do, how do I look these up? So you would make an assumption about a kanji. And so if you saw this character, you'd assume rain was the radical. Um, and the reason why I assume that is because you assume the top of the character is the radical before you assume the bottom. So there is this hierarchy that goes with that. And everyone always forgets this step all in loan that the kanji is itself, that the radical itself, or sorry, that the kanji itself is the radical. Um, but there's all kinds of different odd things going on here. So if you look at the red square, C30 and 31, so if you know their names, the reason why they're separated is a little more obvious, but what, is, what do you think 30 is? Kuchi, mouth, it's the mouth radical. Does anyone know what, thir what, what do you think 31 is? It's one of the first kanji you learn, actually, but it's missing something in it. It's, it's the country radical. So kuni, um, and it's a, it's a kamae, it's one of those enclosure radicals. So the difference between them is that in, with kuchi, you can never put anything inside of it. With, th with this radical, you always put something inside of it. That's what distinguishes them from each other. And this is sort of a convention that when you just look at this, it doesn't make sense at first, but when you see how they're used, it makes a lot more sense. Um, so if you look at 162 right here, you'll notice if you kind of look at the order, it starts with one, and then you have one in brackets, two, two in brackets, three, four, and on and on. And then all of a sudden, it makes this giant leap to 162. All right, so what is that? Why does it have 162 all of a sudden in these special brackets? What is it implying? It's a cross-reference. So if you look at 162 over here, um, so we count up, here it is. And you'll see it, it re-references back. So it's, it's sort of referencing itself through the chart. So if you're looking at a kanji and you actually see this version of it, this is actually how they used to write it before World War II, and this is how they write it now. And this is what it looks like without a variant. So these square brackets mean that you're looking at a variant. If there's no square brackets, you're looking at the unvaried version. So there's all these subtle implications about what's going on. And if you read the forward of the dictionary, it'll explain how all of this symbolism fits together. Um, pretty dry stuff in the modern era with the internet and all that. But when you use an online dictionary, you don't actually engage in a process. You give it information, it spits it back out with you, but you don't know why it works, why it works the way it does. So there's real value to uh, using a, a paper dictionary. So the next one is, if you look up at, uh, in the green box, right, 32, 32, 32. So you can see these really, this gets really unusual. So here's Earth, and then occasionally there's a variation where the lines are just slightly different, but there's also a completely separate radical that uh, means soldier. And then there's this guy, um, which is uh, Tsuchi on the left, if it's not when it's varied. And then actually look at um, 130, Niku. You can see there's a few slight uh, changes there, and what's really confusing about the uh, variance there? What does one of the variants look like? Moon. Yeah. yeah, so the third one looks like the, like the kanji for moon. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, 
And then remember before I was saying left side, right side? Here's what these two carry, ozato and kozato hen. Here's what they look like without their variations. So, so this chart, if you spend time with it, it starts to make a little more sense. But you have to figure out what it's trying to tell you. It's not immediately obvious. It's a little obtuse, admittedly. But it has all the information you need. How about this blue one right here? What's going on here? This one's a little tricky. You have to know a little bit about history. Any guesses? Why? You know, so some of you are a little more advanced. You should definitely know the 211 in brackets. But it's the variant. So what this is, is this is pre-World War II, post-World War II. This is a simplified character. And so the original is the one on the left. This is how Tooth was written before World War II. In the modern era, post-World War II, they simplified it to make it easier. And so technically, even though the variant is the one they write today, this is actually a simplification uh, of the original. And there's a couple, of kanji, uh, a couple of radicals on here that have that same result. <clears throat> so let's look at a few. So to go back to it, radicals can also be deceptive, right? And this one is, so this means, um, if I remember correctly, this one is intestine. I'm forgetting this one. And this one is lung. And they're all parts of the anatomy. So whenever you see moon on the left like this, it's actually the, the um, meat radical. And so we actually call it nikuzuki in Japanese, which literally means meat moon. Um, <laughs> So just know that this is one of those strange conventions that you kind of have to be aware of. And it's particularly confusing if you're seeing it without anyone kind of explaining it to you. But this is always, was definitely one of the most unusual things for me when I moved to Japan. I'm like, I don't understand why this moon radical is in all these anatomical words. It's really strange. And it turns out that because I didn't understand how uh, variation worked, uh, it, it left me really like, confused and trying to figure out what was going on. And then, of course, this goes back to that there's no perfect answer for everything. So if you look in the Nelson's dictionary, there's only two variants. But if you look in this other kanji dictionary, there's three. And this is that uh, dictionary I was showing you before that I thought was arranged a little strange. So this is really counterintuitive for me. I can't understand what's going on. And most Japanese people would look at this pretty baffled. So you really want to be using a system that makes sense also to the Japanese. And, and one thing I also want to point out is this radical system, right? everything that you're seeing here. The thing about this system is, is that this was only invented in the 1700s. Um, how old is the Chinese language? A couple thousand years old. So they've only, the, the way it's arranged now is, is, uh, is, is in its infancy. right? Before this, there was, before this, there was a totally different system for arranging there was actually a 512 radical system. Right? So this was an attempt to make it easier. So just be aware that this is sort of an, it's an imperfect solution. It does not perfectly represent every character. There are all kinds of situations when you're reading characters where none of them quite fit into this whole system. And that creates a lot of situations that don't seem to make sense. And you're going to encounter situations where it's like everything I learned doesn't seem to apply to this one thing. And that's because you're dealing with a 300-year-old two for a thousands of year old language. Or I should say writing system. So um, I want to talk about the enclosures again. So if we start with the kanji on the upper left here, this means street. And specifically, it means like a busy city street. That's usually the implication of it. So how many pieces are there? All right, give me the number of pieces you think it has. Okay. All right, so the, it's three. There's three pieces to it. So there's tsuchi two times. What's the other piece? Iku, Iku to go. Right, so it's actually that, right? But there's situations, there are other characters where just this is the radical. And that leads to a lot of confusion. All right, so if we look at the character on the right, um, how many pieces is that made of? So I see twos and threes. It's actually two. 
And it's, this one is especially tricky. So one piece is this. The other piece is this. And so what happens is, is if you look at this top, right here, they, they rip it apart and they put something in the middle. So just know that this system of, 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 of squeezing and compression and changing is, can be quite flexible and complicated. So this one, means, this character means lake. So uh, how many pieces is it made of, first of all? Right. Three. This one is three. So this one, so three pieces, two pieces, three pieces. So it means lake, so what's the radical? Sansui. Sansui, right? The three water radical. So this is really, this is like an obvious kind of radical. Um, you have something about the radical is related to water, it means lake. Does anyone know what this one means? Old, and this is, is this meat or is it moon? Hmm? Why is it moon? Why is it not meat? How do you know? Yeah, because it's on the right side of the character. It's not on the left side. If it was on the left side, you'd know it was meat. Okay, and then this last one here is namakemono, right? And this one means lazy. So, uh, what's the radical in this one? Kokoro. Kokoro. Why is kokoro the logical radical? Lazy is an emotion. Yeah, it's an emotional state. It's a it's a personality trait. So the heart radical is a good fit for that. And again, this is actually made of three pieces: self, mouth and um, heart. And also, this by itself is a separate character altogether as well. And it has a different radical than this character. OK, so this is going to be interesting. So what is the radical for this character? So first of all, how many pieces does it have? How many radicals are there in this? So it is five, but the trick is which five? So I want to point out that this is one radical, right? In English, they just call it double X. It's the mixing radical, but it's very rarely used in, in kanji. Um, so which character in this is the radical? Anyone want to take a guess? I'll kind of give you some, some hints. Right? What's my, the shape of me is one of the radicals. <laughs> Which is, what does die mean? Big. Big? It is not that character. <laughs> um, what's another possible pick? There's some obvious ones floating there. Right? So there's this one. There's also this one. Gene, or what does gene mean? Person. person? It's not the person radical. Which would be a good guess. The enter radical? No, good guess as well, the enter radical, which looks very similar to person, but with a slight difference. So the radical for this character is this. And this character means sawayaka. It means um, refreshing. You see it all the time on like ice cream packaging in Japan. So, and here's the great thing is that this particular radical, the name of it in Japanese is kana no, like literally the katakana for no, which is that. And here's the thing is that radical doesn't inherently have any meaning. And so this character means refreshing. So how could this possibly be like the semantic indicator? And this is what I meant by not everything fits together neatly. Because the thing is, is that every character needs one radical so they can put it somewhere in the dictionary. And they just all for this one agreed that it was that. And they put it in. But here's the thing, is that some character dictionaries make a compromise. They know that this is really confusing. And so they just tell you that this is the radical, because that's what everybody thinks it is. But it's actually not. But it's such a common mistake that they've sort of turned it into a convention. Okay? And this is the, the cruelty of one-stroke radicals. So if you're getting really stuck on a character, there's a really good chance that the kanji is probably, that the kanji probably has a radical that's only one or two strokes. And so it's really, really 
hidden inside of this complicated looking character. There's a few other examples of that situation that, that do exist. So, you know, on the one hand, a character like this actually gets really complicated and confusing. But on the other hand, really complicated looking characters can actually be broken down into their basic parts. So let's kind of hash this one out. So first of all, how would you start to divide this character? What, how, what's, what, what pieces does it have? What sides does it have? Yeah, so, well, I would say it has a left and a right. And then, and this is, this is the important part, right? So you, there we go. That's what I wanted to hear, right? So there's not a middle part. There's no middle. So there's a distinct left side and there's a distinct right side. Um, and then the right side has two distinct parts as well. And what, how would you explain those sides? Right? If you look at your sheet, you could tell me the actual names. Right, what's this part called? Nyo, right? And then this is the inside of it. And actually, one way to talk, when we talk about this in English, we say the inside and the outside. Even though it's a little strange to say it that way, that's just how we make the distinction. And so, you know, try to diagram this stuff out in your brain. Because each, each white piece you can fit yet another diagram into, and another diagram into, and a diagram within a diagram within a diagram. So <clears throat> let's try this one. So what, what are the distinct parts of this character? How would you divide it up initially? Bottom. Yeah, so a top part and a bottom part. Then which chunk can be divided even more? Mm -hmm. And how would you divide the bottom part? Outside, it's an outside-inside situation, yeah. So it's like this. So this mon, gate, this is east, and this is grass, and this actually means orchid or ran, and it tends to be associated with the Netherlands or Holland. <clears throat> and that's another talk for another day. But, um, and so when things get really, really complicated, it starts to, this like graphing system starts to break down a little bit. It gets really, really hard to do. Um, does anyone happen to know this word? On Japanese TV, they always bring this word up as like a challenge. Like, can you write this? Can you read this? Right? This is the word for rose or bara. Um, and so if we try to hash this one out, so, what, what, so first of all, what are the radicals for these? Right, if it's a rose, then the top part means grass or plant. So that's why those are the radicals, because this radical is associated with plants. So obviously, we're talking about roses, things like that. And then if we try to start breaking this down, how many pieces or radicals are inside this first character, would you say? That's the basic division. Yeah, do, if you did the whole thing, how would you try to break this down? How many pieces are in here? Six, yeah. So uh, grass, tsuchi, or earth, person, person. And then this one, right? Remember this? What's the outside one? Kuni, right? The country radical. And what's this one? Kuchi, yeah. And one thing to point out, too, and this is where uh, some of this breaks down, but if you're familiar with this character, does anybody know the meaning? Kai, like number of times? Yeah, or to go around and around. And this is country, and this is mouth, and these radicals are not being used because of what they mean. They're being used because it creates a visual interpretation of the thing it's trying to convey. <clears throat> okay. And so when you start to look at something like the, the Nelsons, so how you start putting all this stuff together and making sense of it, this is what I did uh, back in 2000 to 2004 when I was in school. The internet was not quite what it is today, but... Um, at, when you take the Nelson's Dictionary and you start looking through it, and the big thing is, is we're going to talk about the many, many numbers that are built into the uh, dictionary, but you'll see, here's the beginning of a radical section. This is Hitsuji, or sheep, goat. And it actually tells you what it's called. It tells you what it's called at the left and what it looks like, and it tells you what it's called at the top. 
because there's all these variations and some radicals have more than one name because just different parts of Japan had different names for it um, and different conventions. And so you have to build all that in. You can see Hito is a particularly complicated one. It's called Nimben when it's on the left at the top. You can call it Yane or Hito Yane or Hito Gashira, right? And so now it's not just like, oh, I'll remember one word. Now I have three words to remember. Oh, God, this is the worst system ever. But it's something you get used to over time, for sure. And one of the points I would make about all this, so this is yamai, or uh, yamai dare, and the dare is the tare, meaning like to overhang like this. And so we're dealing with all these systems and names and conventions and, oh my god, I have to learn all this stuff? And the answer is yes, you do, because you're good students. But to back it up for a moment, right, a kanji, this is, this is an analogy, just run with me for a moment, but a, a word in English with its spelling and its quirks and all that, is very much uh, like a kanji, right? The kanji is made of pieces, a word is made of pieces. So kanji have radicals, English words have letters. And you know, one of the things we forget about is that we take all the things that we do as native English speakers for granted. So for example, how many letters are there in the English language? Okay. If you didn't speak English, why would you ever think those two things are the same? Okay. You just take this for granted. So one more time, how many letters are there in English? 52. OK. Um, again, how many letters are there in English? 112. Right? But what about when you see something like that and you get the variant? Right? Why would you think that those are the same? They look similar, but are they the same? I don't know. What about when you start italicizing things, right? We, just take all that information for granted. And so we're like, oh, there are 26 letters in, in English. But there's not. There's more like 112 or 14. right? We take that all for granted. And then all of the conventions that go into how we spell words and why they are the way they are, um, you know, that's something that we spend years learning about in school. And Japanese children spend years learning all of this stuff and putting it together over time. It doesn't come immediately. It doesn't come quickly. But in bits and pieces, you slowly start to put the picture together. And so knowing that there's a sort of structural system in place, you can start to make sense of all of this stuff and why it is the way it is and why it's set up the way it's been set up. And so this is actually the final slide of my presentation. And so what I want to know now is what are some of your questions and curiosities about how all this stuff is set up? What are some unusual situations you feel like you've run into that you want answers to? Or what looks super confusing on this? I'm looking at some of these one-stroke radicals. Mm -hmm. How do you ever? How do you like? How do you ever pick out a one-stroke radical out of a complicated conjugate? You know, there's not that many. That's yeah, that's the beauty of it. Yeah, there aren't very many, but there's still just like every single kanji basically has one of these in it. Right. Um, because you become so. This is when familiarity becomes really important. So let's take an example in English, actually. So if I say, um, so if I write this, this word for you, potion, right? This T-I-O-N you know is pronounced shun. And you start applying this to a lot of other scenarios and situations. So multiplication, like you at least know that, that end part has a certain way to be pronounced, shun. So you see T-I-O-N over and over and over again in different English words. So what starts to happen here is, yeah, maybe the radical is one, but chances are really good that it's not. And if you follow um, if you follow this hierarchical system, this is what students always mess up when they, they learn to uh, identify radicals. But if you follow this, you'll pretty much set yourself up for success right away <clears throat> for identifying it clearly. And of course, you know, this is the paper version, and I think there's a lot of value in it. But of course, eventually, you are, guys are just going to use something online. Like, I do that all the time myself. But I did bust my chops on these paper dictionaries, and so I actually understand sort of all the relationships that are occurring together with all these characters. There's a lot of value in sort of trying to find it in a paper dictionary and failing, and then having to reevaluate and figure out what you did wrong and guess again and, and kind of move through that process. There are some truly difficult and infuriating characters, but you will get a feel for it. Right? Just like how we all know that kernel is spelled in a really funny way, most Japanese people know like, oh, this one character, it looks like it should be this, but it's actually that. Like, it's just common knowledge amongst the population that speaks the language. What else are you curious about with all of this stuff? I 
as you stare blankly in fear at it all. And, and I would tell you that depending how you look at it, you could, do, you could learn all of this in a weekend. Um, there's online flashcards. It's pretty manageable. And there's different ways to approach it. So for example, you know, for those of you in the 1,000 level just starting out, the thing that probably matters the most is just knowing the English nicknames and just having a feel for it that way, or even just being comfortable with the positions. You don't have to worry too much about what to call it in Japanese, but I can tell you that when you're on the phone with somebody, um, you know, the way they talk is they talk in terms of this tare and this hen. So right now, the consular general in Denver, his name is Hirakoba. And so Hira, I could imagine in my head, and then I was like, well, what's the ko and what's the ba? And we had to talk it out in, um, in, uh, over the phone together, because I was writing a thank you card. And I was like, I don't actually know the, the kanji for the consular general's name. And so they had to explain it to me over the phone what it looked like. And because I knew how to talk about it, I could visualize in my head what was being said to me. Mm -hmm. So are these 214 radicals the only radicals there are, or are there more than this? The answer is sort of. The answer is yes. So in the Kong Shi radical system, which is what that is, those are the 214 radicals, and then it ends. Um, but like I said, that was only invented in the 1700s. So the fact that those are the only ones is sort of like a malleable feature because it's just a product produced at that time and that's the standard ever since then. So the answer is yes, kind of no, but mostly yes. Like there's not a, per see how there's like not a clean answer to your question? Like yeah. it's just good enough. And that's what a lot of these things are. These systems I'm showing you, these are good enough. They're not going to get you through every situation and you have to make a decision when you run into situations where you can't take all of these rules and mash them together in a result. But you say this on the chart of 214 is the ones we're going to run into like 99% oh, yeah. of the time or something? Yeah, and actually of that, there's a subset of about 60 that overwhelmingly uh, take up most of it. Because there's one, for example, this, uh, where is it? So if you look at radical, radical, um, give me a sec here to find it. It's, it's a good one. I'm glad that they specifically set it aside to make it that special. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Yeah. Is it, is it, oh gosh. Oh, here it is, 192. If you look at radical 192. So that radical is only the radical of two or three characters, and that's it. It's the radical of nothing else. That radical means ceremonial wine jug. <laughs> just in, you know, and in a way, you know, these radicals are sort of an expression of what's important. And I love the idea that ceremonial wine jug is so important that it got separated out as its own distinct radical. Um, and and you're, you'll almost never see it. That's the thing. Like, sure, you could learn it, and then you'll never see it the entire time you're in Japan. So there's this sort of sense of investment. If you Googled around for like most common radicals, you get a list of about 60 or 66 of them. And that is the most productive use of your time. Like, the, the higher the count gets, the less and less likely you're going to see it. Like, this character here, Hana, or Nose, it, it's actually a fairly common word, but it's the radical of barely any characters. But you'll see it plenty of times because it just happens to be incorporated into a common word. And many of these radicals stand for things that are very common to everyday life. The bug radical, the dish radical, um, the tongue radical. Some of them are kind of like culturally unique, like the usu radical, which is, refers to the wet liquid at the bottom of a mochi making bowl, right? Very culturally significant idea. Um, so, so things like that is kind of interesting. You get a little hint about like sort of what are the, the, the things in the, you know, this is again, 3,000 year old system. So we're talking about the priorities of people 3,000 years ago, right? But this system itself was invented in 1700, in the 1700s. So it's the values in the 1700s of what people thought was most important. So, um, you know, a system is always imbued with its cultural significance in some way. What else is up here that intrigues you? Oh, and actually, before I forget, uh, so this guy right here is the Morohashi Daikan wa Jiten. You probably will never need to use this unless you become a master's student and pursue a PhD in Japanese. But this is, this is a one volume of, I think, 14 volumes. This is the index volume. Uh, there are 
uh, every, this dictionary set has every character ever made that's ever been written ever with every variant that could ever have happened in the written history of Chinese and Japanese. Um, it's massive. It's one of the only dictionaries in the world that even competes with the Oxford English Dictionary in terms of size and breadth. Um, and the only reason it's shorter is because Japanese as a language is much more densely packed in its writing system. So uh, it's actually really cool. You can find some of the most interesting characters in here. There's over 50,000, I think. And almost all of them are not in use. But the, I just love knowing that there's a kanji. Um, you know, there's this kanji, right? And there's this kanji. And there's, oops, yeah, that'll do. And there's this kanji. And I just love the fact that this is actually a character. Sure, it means like jungle or something, um, but it's really in there. That's the crazy part. So, but most of it's out of use. But if you're ever interacting with like older texts, this may be a valuable asset. But the thing about this that I really wanted to show you was, so this really messy looking um, paper that you see here with all these cross references and different uh, different things to look at. If you actually look at it the way it's done in this dictionary, you'll see it's so much cleaner, and that's because. Uh, there's a base level of assumption about the user of the dictionary. So Japanese people just understand so many more of the conventions that I'm teaching you today that they don't need the cross-referencing system. They just know that, for example, you know, this and this is this and this. They know that already. So they know what they're doing when they're looking in the character dictionary. Same thing with Nikuzuki. There's not like this whole explanation for it in a lot of dictionaries. They just know that that's one of the ways that it's arranged, and they just know where to look. So they're not looking under, you know, one, two, three, four strokes. They're looking under one, two, three, four, five, six strokes. So they see this, and even though it's four, they're thinking six in terms of the number of strokes. Because this radical system is actually, so this part is actually arranged by the number of strokes. So. What else is floating in your brains? I um, actually picked up a kanji dictionary for when I started intermediate Japanese. Mm -hmm. It was like the one. It was like the beginner kanji dictionary we have at the bookstore. Okay. And that one arranges basically all the kanji just by a complete number of strokes. Okay. And then like it subdivides into is it a left right kanji and how many strokes are each part? Should I like move away from that? Wait, system? is that the um, skip code system? I don't know what it's called. Is it's it like, is it this one? Is it this dictionary right here? No, it's red, but it looks like. So this. Same. So this is um. So this was a, is a system created by uh, da, 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 oh, where's his name Jack Halpern, and he's done a few quite a few interesting books on Japanese. So he created a different system called the skip system, which uh, basically every character has a three number code, and so first is the character left right is it top bottom is it inside outside or is it other? So those are the only four structural categories, and then it's the number of strokes for one side of the character and one and a number of strokes for the other side. And this looks like a great system for people learning Japanese, except no Japanese person knows what you're talking about. This is completely foreign to Japanese people. And it, it is useful. And actually, this is a fantastic dictionary. It's actually uh, a good investment. This dictionary, although the way you look up kanji is really unusual. Um, and the thing I don't like about it is that it, it, it takes you away from how the kanji are actually structured. And it prevents you from actually learning in the long term, how kanji are arranged and how to handle learning thousands of characters. Because you're, you're sort of being taken away from the structural system that is actually in place and that j you can't talk to Japanese people because this isn't with how they understand the arrangement. That being said, the semantic capacity of this dictionary is fantastic. It does such a good job explaining what the characters mean and how they're used and why they're used the way they are. It's absolutely fantastic on that level. I just don't like the way it looks up. But I have a copy anyway, because I think they do such a fantastic job sort of explaining the meaning of character. So there's a compromise happening there. I know this isn't the right way, but it's really great for other reasons. So I roll with it, and I, I use it sometimes. Yeah.